Well, good morning, and thank you everyone for joining us for the 2021 WCA Regional Legislative Meeting. Um, for, for those of you that have joined us for these meetings in the past, you know that this setting is a, a little bit different than what we typically do. Um, typically, every budget year, so every two years, uh, the WCA Government Affairs team goes around the state to each of WCA's uh, respective districts and holds in-person regional legislative meetings, which serve as really an in-depth briefing of what the governor's budget looks like and what the priorities for the association are heading into the legislature taking their turn um, at amending the state budget. Of course, given uh, the pandemic, we're doing things a, a little bit differently this year, and, and this meeting um, is being held virtual. Uh, we're hopeful that this will be the only virtual time we'll have to do these. And, and in two years, we'll be uh, back on the road visiting um, each and every one of you within your districts. But on behalf of, of the Counties Association, I want to thank you again for taking the time to, to join us on this Monday morning to, to hear a little bit um, about the state budget. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items for those of you um, that have been following us closely and tuned into the legislative exchange. Um, what you're going to see today is, is relatively similar to what uh, we showed during our legislative update at WCA's legislative exchange a couple of weeks ago. Um, the difference is that we're going to provide additional detail today. Um, we're probably going to go a, a little over two hours and really dive into some of the specifics in the state budget as, as introduced by the governor. Um, at any time, feel free to use either the chat or the Q&A function. Um, if you have any questions or comments you'd like us to consider, uh, we'll be watching um, both those are areas very closely and uh, we'll take questions whenever we receive them. In addition, at the end of each section, um, when a member of the WCA Government Affairs team completes their section, we'll also open it up to questions at that time. So um, if you are on the phone and joining us that way this morning, a star nine will allow you to unmute your phone. So again, on behalf of the Counties Association, thank you for, for joining us and, and we'll get started here. Sarah, can we go to the next slide, please? All right, so when we look at the state budget, again, one of the things that, that everybody wants to know or everybody wants to look at is how much money do we have, actually have to spend, right? And, and I don't think that's really any different than when we're looking at county budgets. You look at how much money you have and you really you know, um, pick and choose kind of your expenses from there. So when, when we look at the, the, the kind of finances of this state budget, a couple things to, to keep in mind. Um, first is that the state is going to end um, this fiscal year that ends the end of June. So the, the new fiscal year will start July 1 and, and that's where this budget will essentially take effect. Um, they're gonna end that um, with a little over a billion dollars in, in essentially surplus, right? So the majority of that money gets is carried over to the next budget. In addition to that, however, the governor has proposed a number of general fund tax changes that also generate additional funds in this budget. Um, in particular, if, if you look here at the net change in the bottom right corner of the slide, what you can see is that the governor is calling for uh, essentially additional tax increases, totaling about $500 million in each year of the upcoming biennium. So that essentially leaves us with a billion dollars in new revenue. Now, when you look at um, the governor's budget and you look at where they start to where they end, essentially the, the governor spends this money. So the provisions in the governor's budget um, are essentially funded in part with a billion dollars of, of revenue enhancements. And, and why this is important and why we're spending a little time on it is because in the event the legislature does not go along with these tax increases, which we don't expect them to, to do, um, they're gonna start in a whole about a billion dollars, right? If you, if you don't raise a billion dollars in new revenue from the governor's budget, you have to then cut a billion dollars in expenditures from the governor's budget. So <clears throat> while, while the, the governor's budget does have significantly new revenues, um, about a billion dollars of them in tax increases will not, mater will not materialize, right? In addition to that though, the governor also calls for the expansion um, of Medicaid. So Medicaid expansion been a hot topic um, around the country for a number of years. The governor's budget calls for Medicaid expansion. That generates you know, anywhere from seven to $900 million a year in additional revenue. Um, that's not included in, in this chart. So you're looking at really $2 billion that um, the legislature is going to have to cut in spending because they're not going to do 
um, a number of the tax changes or Medicaid, Medicaid expansion as proposed by the governor. So I, I think, you know, we've heard a lot from legislative leaders saying, yeah, there's a lot of great things in this budget because there's a lot of no revenue. Um, there's not going to necessarily be um, those types of revenues in, in the budget once the legislature, um, you know, starts amending it. So that, that's, um, I, I think, something that everybody needs to consider when looking at, you know, what may come uh, when the legislature begins its work in, in about a month or so. Uh, moving on uh, to the next slide here, what, what we can see um, is where does the, the money for the budget essentially come from, right? And, and in general, it comes from really two places. It comes from GPR, that's the state's general fund that is funded primarily by individual income, corporate income, and then state sales tax. Um, and, and in addition to that, then you have about 30% of the budget coming from federal dollars. One of the reasons that, that this chart is important is because this chart reflects the governor's budget as introduced. What it does not include, however, is the uh, over $3 billion that the state is going to receive from the American Rescue Plan that was signed into law by President Biden on Thursday. So again, um, this chart really doesn't tell a whole story because what we expect is that the governor who has sole discretion over the three plus billion dollars coming from the federal government, um, the governor is going to spend those dollars. We don't know exactly how or where, but it's quite possible that the budget is going to be more reliant on federal funding um, than this chart shows because of the influx of, of you know, $3.2 billion. Uh, one of the reasons that's important is we need to remember that those federal dollars are essentially one-time funds, right? So if you, if you go back to um, really 2009 and the Doyle administration, the Obama administration, where there was another similar stimulus package, um, the Doyle administration at that time used those dollars to fund K-12 schools, um, which may be a, a worthy cause of using those dollars, but remember they're one time. So essentially what you do, if you use federal one-time dollars on ongoing appropriations, you're, you're essentially creating a deficit or a structural imbalance going into the next budget because those dollars won't be there. So it'll be um, very interesting to see where the governor um, decides to allocate these federal dollars, knowing that if they go to existing programs, that means that in the next budget, we're going to have to have state funds replace those federal funds or we're going to have significant cuts in those programs. So just something that, that we should all be thinking about. Again, where does the, you know, the state's revenue really come from? Um, and, and this is something that, that's no surprise. Really, because we are a, a high individual income tax state relative to other states around the country, and because we have a pretty narrow revenue base, um, almost half of all the state's uh, revenue comes from the individual income tax. Of course, the, the next um, biggest kind of piece of this pie is the state sales tax that represents about a third of, of the state budget. Um, but our sales tax relative to the other states is, is kind of middle of the pack. So this goes back to, to something we've been talking about at the association for you know, 20, 30 plus years, which is the state really needs to, to talk about comprehensive tax reform and maybe um, taking another look at how we fund services. Because if, if we don't wanna be a high income tax state, really the only way to do that is to kind of broaden the revenue mix that we have at our disposal. And right now, um, as you can see, we, we don't really have that. Um, I, you know, the other thing that, that's always interesting to look at in the state budget, um, again, as proposed by the governor is, uh, where, where does the money go? Or in other words, what programs are seeing the largest increases? So what we can see here is that the governor's budget um, over the biennium spends um, about an additional $3.2 billion over the current budget. So there's essentially $3.2 billion in new money that the governor spends in this budget. Where does it go? Of course, half the money or about half of all the increases in the state budget go to K-12 education. And you can see that here in the Department of Public Instruction. They're, they're looking at about $1.6 billion in additional funding, and that comprises about half of all the new spending. In addition to um, the Department of Public Instruction, which, which should really come to no surprise to anybody considering um, the governor's background as um, state superintendent, 
and the governor's um, last budget where he also proposed um, some significant increases in DPI. Th this wasn't really surprising. I don't think the second item here is surprising here. That's Department of Health Services. As we know, over the last 20 years, uh, medical assistance for the state's Medicaid program continues to account for a growing share of the state budget and state spending. And we're seeing here they receive about $460 million in additional revenue under the governor's proposed plan. Then the, the third item here, which is interesting um, and maybe a little surprising, is that the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, or WEDIC, remember the, this was changed under the Walker administration. This was essentially the old um, um, <clears throat> Commerce Department that was essentially morphed into a, a quasi public private agency, um, which is now WEDIC or the Economic Development Corporation. Um, what you see here is they're receiving an additional $320 million um, in the WEDIC budget. Uh, why? Uh, the, the explanation is pretty simple, right? That the governor is putting significant resources into WEDIC to provide additional aid to entities, businesses, individuals affected by the pandemic. So a, a number of the pandemic relief associated items in this budget fall within um, WEDIC, and that's why we see the, the $300 million plus increase um, in WEDIC. So that, that's really, I think, the story of this budget. Where does the money go? About half of the new money goes to K-12 education, um, a sizable increase in the Department of Health Services, Medicaid, and then a $300 plus million dollar invest, additional investment in the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation to assist in current and post-pandemic relief to uh, businesses and individuals. <laughs> Then we go to, you know, where does the budget, you know, allocate um, from a kind of a broader perspective, right? We, we know a, a, a significant resources are going to schools, we know they're going to K-12, but, but if you kind of group these categories together, where, where does the, the budget spend its money? And what you can see is half the, the money in the state budget goes to local assistance. And that is primarily um, aids to K-12 education and aids to local government, including counties. Um, the next biggest share, of course, is in aids to individuals. This is, again, some of your social services programs, um, including the Medicaid program. The reason I think that, that this chart is interesting, why we include it, is because it, it tells the story of how Wisconsin is relatively unique compared to other states in the country, not only in how it generates money, but then where the money goes, right? And what I mean by that is that what you can see is half the state budget essentially is money that the state took in through state tax collections, but then goes back out to local governments. Um, the reason that this is unique is that typically what, what you have in states is whatever level of government is providing the service, so doing the spending, they also typically raise the revenue. So if local governments or counties are providing the majority of services, they would provide or they would um, collect the majority of tax revenue. That's not the case in Wisconsin. In Wisconsin, we have this disconnect where the state collects the majority of the revenue, but then redistributes it back to local governments. And again, th this is a function, especially as, as it relates to counties in Wisconsin, of counties really being the service delivery arm of the state. And, and given counties have um, really no significant revenue options other than the, the property tax and a very small local sales tax, um, that necessitates this chart, which is essentially the state sending back um, about half of all the money it collects back to local governments, again, including schools. So this is nothing new. Um, you know, th this chart would be um, really unchanged going back, you know, decades, um, but it is something that, that is unique to Wisconsin, something that I think is important to, to highlight. So that's generally the, the overview, um, kind of from 30,000 feet of, of the state budget. At this point, we'll transition a little bit into individual um, issue areas. But before I, I start in, in a few items on taxation and finance, I think it's important to, to mention kind of where we're at in this budget process. So we all know that the governor introduced his budget. We know that the Joint Committee on Finance, that's the state's budget writing committee, they have met and essentially accepted the budget. So the budget is now sitting with joint finance, but they haven't taken any action on it. And there's a couple of reasons for that. 
First, um, the nonpartisan legislative fiscal bureau is still completing its summary of the budget. And when I say a summary, I don't mean that they're going to leave out items, but rather they're going to take a legal statutory language that the budget's drafted in, and they're going to turn it into a plain English summary so that everybody on this call, everybody in the Capitol fully understands each provision in the governor's budget, um, along with kind of an explanation of, of why that provision exists. That process typically takes the Legislative Fiscal Bureau anywhere from two to four weeks. We do expect um, probably in the next uh, week to 10 days that we will see a, a summary from the Fiscal Bureau and that really starts triggering action by the Joint Committee on Finance. Um, the committee has announced, uh, has announced that they will continue their road show. That's where the Joint Committee on Finance goes around the state, typically holds five to seven different hearings um, in large settings. Think maybe a, a school gymnasium, um, or a, a theater where essentially they'll sit there all day and take testimony from members of the public. Uh, the Finance Committee has now noticed these meetings. We have one in the Rhinelander area, one in Eau Claire, and then one in Whitewater. So there will only be three um, in-person um, joint finance public hearings that the public can attend. And then in addition, the Finance Committee is holding one virtual uh, session as well. So as we get closer to, to those sessions, uh, we will be uh, developing talking points for the membership so that any, any county official interested in attending those in person um, will have a list of a few things that we'd suggest they talk about, or in the event they're joining uh, the virtual um, uh, public hearing, uh, they, they can also um, use our talking points for, for that as well. In addition, the Finance Committee will also be bringing in um, a number of agency secretaries to talk about the state budget. Uh, our understanding is that maybe as few as four or five agency secretaries this time around, but essentially the secretaries will come in, will explain what's in their respective budgets, and then take questions from the committee. Once all of that is completed, uh, what, we expect, what we expect to happen um, probably a month from now, if not sooner, is that the Finance Committee will start their executive sessions on the budget. And that's where the Finance Committee will take up the budget section by section, and start essentially amending it, right? Removing things, adding things, changing things. Um, that's where the rubber really meets the road. And that'll probably happen in, in the next month or so. Of course, the goal is always to have the budget completed uh, prior to June 30th, which is the end of the current fiscal year. Um, whether or not that will materialize or unsure, you recall that the last budget was signed just, just past the uh, start of the new fiscal year, the new biennium. It's important to note, however, that unlike the federal government, where if they don't have a, a budget signed into law or continuing resolution, essentially funding goes away. That's not what happens in Wisconsin. In Wisconsin, in the event that we never passed a budget, we would continue on existing appropriation levels. So it's not as though uh, we're gonna have a government shutdown in Wisconsin. Um, if the, the budget isn't passed on time, we'll just continue on the current trajectory. So that's something very different than what happens in, in Washington, D.C. So with that, moving on to taxation and finance. Um, maybe the, the biggest item in the entire state budget for counties is the governor's proposal to allow local governments, um, counties in particular, and then all counties, all 72 counties, and uh, municipalities over 30,000 in population to adopt uh, an additional 0.5% sales tax um, with approval from voters at referendum. So recall that all, all 72 counties currently have the ability to add an optional half percent sales tax via ordinance. This would allow an additional half percent, so a total of 1% sales tax um, for counties and large municipalities if this is approved by a referendum. This is something that, that we had requested. Um, this is something we're incredibly supportive of and will be pushing. However, it's unlikely that this provision will stay in the budget. In fact, I, I assume when the Finance Committee um, begins its first meeting and they pull probably 200 items out of the state budget, this is probably one of those items they, they remove right away. That doesn't mean that it can't come back in, but there is clearly a resistance or opposition amongst legislators and legislative leaders to this proposal. Um, so the likelihood of this passing, I think, is, is very slim. However, I, I do think that we'll be working with other partners on standalone legislation um, to do something similar to this. Now, it may have to be a pilot program 
So for example, um, Milwaukee County um, may have a pilot program where, where they're allowed to do this with some restrictions, um, but I don't think that there's an appetite in the legislature to do this statewide. Again, that doesn't mean that we're not going to be working on it, but we also wanna be realistic um, in the information that we share. In addition to the local sales tax, um, a couple of other familiar items in the governor's budget. Um, the first relates to shared revenue. Similar to the last budget, the governor does provi provide successive 2% increases in the county and municipal aid program. That's the shared revenue program. So those would take place in both the first year and the second year of the budget. So essentially a 4% increase over the biennium in shared revenue. Um, while we haven't seen a, a significant shared revenue increase in over a decade, uh, I do think that there's momentum for this. Um, especially uh, the Speaker of the Assembly um, was doing an interview recently and said, look, I'm, I'm not really in favor of the sales tax, you know, but shared revenue is maybe something we could look at. Of course, the majority of shared revenue funding does not go to counties, it goes to cities and villages. However, an increase in shared revenue would be welcome and that'll be something that we'll be prioritizing as we move um, through this budget process. In addition to that, of course, there are levy limit changes. This is again, very similar to what the governor proposed in the last budget. Essentially what the governor proposes is a 2% minimum growth factor for levy limit purposes. What that essentially means is that you would have a floor of 2%. So recall um, under current law, county levy limits are limited to your change in property values due to new construction. So we typically see that being anywhere from three tenths of a percent to maybe as high as 3% um, in a couple of areas around the state. Um, what this says is regardless of your new construction, even if you only have 0.1% new construction, you would always have the ability to increase your tax levy by 2%. We view it as kind of an inflationary adjustment, right? Uh, again, this is something that the governor had proposed last budget. This was removed early on in the process. I assume that the Finance Committee will, will do something similar this time. However, we've already been began conversations with our other local government partners in strategizing how we retain this provision in the state budget. Um, in addition, there is a change in the budget uh, requested by WCA relating to debt issuance. And this would essentially allow counties to issue debt to replace revenue lost during um, a disaster or a public health emergency declared either by the governor or the county board itself. Um, th this was an issue that we talked about early on in the pandemic when we didn't know what the impact COVID-19 would have on county revenues and we were um, incredibly concerned about county cash flow issues rising. arising. So um, this is a provision that would allow us to essentially issue debt for Know, general fund purposes. Um, I'm not sure how, how much of an issue this, this is anymore, um, considering that uh, we have about a billion dollars in, in federal funds um, coming directly to Wisconsin 72 counties. And an eligible use of those funds is to replace um, lost revenue during the pandemic. Um, but regardless, we still think that, that this is a good option or a tool in the toolbox for counties, even if they don't use it during this pandemic, there may be other you know, emergency or disaster declarations um, where counties do need to use this tool. And this is something that, that we're very supportive of. So that um, really completes the taxation and finance section. I don't see right now um, any questions that anybody has. Again, if you have questions during this, you can use the chat or the Q&A function. In addition, if you're joining us via phone this morning, you can use star nine to, uh, mute, uh, to unmute your phone. In addition, you can use the raised hand function. And if, and if we see um, that from any participants, we'll make sure we call on you. But given we don't see any questions here, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Dan Barr, to highlight the issues in agriculture, environment, and land use. Dan? Thank you, Kyle. Good morning, everyone. Um, very informative presentation. Um, we do have some issues uh, in the budget related to environment and land use that I'll talk about. Um, much going on and we'll be working very hard this uh, budget season to try to protect the interest of counties on these issues and others. Um, but we'll start out with an issue that um, I think a lot of people have been following for some time. Um, and this relates to the Warren Knowles, Warren Knowles Gaylord Nelson Stewardship Program. Um, and there's been some debate amongst the legislature. It started out, I think last session, um, the governor, um, there had been some speculation that he might push for a 10 year reauthorization of, of the program. Um, he did not do that in the 1921 budget. Instead, what he did 
um, was uh, proposed a two-year reauthorization of the program, and he was hoping then to appoint a blue ribbon panel to study the program, to find efficiencies, to make sure that um, the state is, is, is not accruing too much debt service. Issues like that have been brought up related to the, the stewardship program. And essentially, um, for two years, they wanted to study it. They wanted a blue ribbon panel of experts to look into uh, stewardship to, to make it the best program possible. Um, essentially, though, that never came to fruition. You had issues like COVID that prevented them from meeting in person. Uh, the panel, the blue ribbon panel that uh, the governor had proposed never got off the ground. And so essentially, um, that, that, that left the program essentially ending um, without reauthorization. And so coming into this budget, you know, they're, they're scrapping the blue ribbon panel. The governor has proposed um, extending the life of the program for 10 years. Um, until fiscal year 31, 32, 10 years out, um, at $70 million per year. And, and this is a program that will, uh, you know, the, the land that is purchased, it's purchased through bonding. Um, and so it's interesting though, there is some opposition to the reauthorization for 10 years. Uh, some of the individuals in the state Senate, Republican senators, conservative Republican senators, um, do not favor reauthorization of the program. Um, one of the senators I talked to, and, and I had a very good conversation with her, um, she had mentioned, well, you know, I'd, I'd like to see more general purpose revenue spent as opposed to bonding. She is concerned about the level of debt service that accrues as a result of land purchases and the bonding that takes place. And so this is something that will be discussed. These are some of the themes that we hear about this program uh, during the Joint Committee on Finance process as this is considered. Um, but essentially, as it stands right now, the governor's proposal does call for a tenure reauthorization, something that will be heatedly debated, I think, during the joint finance process. Um, the program does have a lot of uh, support in the assembly on the assembly side of joint finance with the assembly speaker's office with uh, assembly members of joint finance it'll just be interesting to hear what comes out of the senate what they're open to on this program but um, something we're certainly tracking of course with our county forest lands and and uh, with the, the benefits of the program old state it's something wca does support um, and we'll continue to have conversations with uh, members of the legislature and various stakeholders as to how we can move this forward in a productive way so Dan, is it, is it safe to say on the stewardship program that it, it's, it's unlikely the legislature will adopt what the governor has proposed, but maybe we're more likely to see some sort of compromise? Yeah, I think, I think that's a, a, a fair statement, Kyle. I think that's very likely that you're going to see, obviously the governor came out with $70 million a year in, in bonding. Um, I think Republican members, particularly in the Senate, are concerned with that number. They think it's a little bit high. And so I, I do think the legislature, at the end of the day, um, you're going to, if it does pass, if it does stay in, and I think that there is a good chance it will, you're going to see some sort of uh, uh, agreement uh, amongst the, between the Senate and the Assembly, sending it back to the governor um, at a much lower number in terms of the bonding that's available. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, another issue we've been working on, we'll move on to um, the issue of a tipping fee exemption um, for waste energy facilities. And you can kind of see the photo um, of the sign of the Barron County Waste Energy Facility located uh, near Turtle Lake, Wisconsin. Um, and there's also another waste energy facility located in La Crosse County, Wisconsin in the town of Campbell, French Island. Um, and what these facilities do, um, you have two types of I, what I would say recycling facilities. You have a waste energy facilities, which is what we're talking about. There's only two of them in the state. You also have what's known as a MRF, which is a material recovery facility. That's a much more common facility. A lot of communities have MRFs um, and so what a MRF does it is it takes in all the tonnage it receives, they sort through all the tonnage of waste, um, and what they recycle, they recycle, and what they don't recycle, they send back to the landfill and they are charged a tipping fee on any of the tonnage that is sent back to the landfill. Now, the MRFs um, do get an exemption on a certain percentage of the tonnage they receive. Um, the waste energy facilities do not. But in contrast, how the waste energy facility works essentially is they take in uh, the total tonnage they receive, they sort through it just like the MRF does. And then just like the MRF, the waste energy facility, first they look for things they can recycle, they take that, and they recycle it. And then what they can't recycle, um, they incinerate, they burn. And the burning process, the incineration process generates energy. In the case of Barron County, this facility, they use energy to uh, help power the Sartori Cheese Factory, again, located just south of, a few miles south of uh, Turtle Lake, Wisconsin. Um, and certainly there's a benefit to the taxpayers. They, the county receives a payment for the energy from the cheese plant that they, that they uh, um, generate and they lower energy costs with that as a benefit to the county. Same is true in La Crosse County. 
that's an Excel facility. They run it in partnership with the county. The county owns the facility. Excel runs it. Um, and the ratepayers in La Crosse County benefit from that facility. Um, so essentially, they, they store everything out. They, they recycle what they recycle. They burn what they burn. But the waste energy facilities do not get an exemption, um, a certain percent, percentage exemption of the total tonnage of waste they receive, or sorry, that they put into the landfill. And we're, so we're trying to get them that same exemption that the MERS received. In this case, we're looking um, for an exemption of up to 30% of the total tonnage received. So that would incentivize then the waste energy facilities to um, recycle and or incinerate 70% of the tonnage they receive, because then if they, if they do those two things, they recycle and or they incinerate 70% of the total tonnage they receive, um, they would not pay a tipping fee at all. They, they would get an exemption for up to 30% of the tonnage that could go into the landfill without a tipping fee. So that is our goal with, with this, uh, this proposal, which is included in the governor's budget, something um, I've been working on and, and, and our staff has been working on for a long, long time. We've been working in partnership with both La Crosse and Barron County to try to get this done. And so we are excited it's in the budget. Uh, there has been support all over the place in terms of uh, both sides of the aisle, in terms of the governor now supports it. Um, we had Senate Republicans, some very conservative Senate Republicans who supported it. Um, same with the Assembly, Assembly Dems and Republicans. So they like the concept. We think it's a benefit and we're going to work very, very hard to try and get this done. Uh, county conservation staffing and cost sharing grants. Um, essentially, you have, uh, you know, we've worked on this issue and, and, and again, there's some history back behind this program, but essentially the governor's proposal calls for about $12.7 million annually in this upcoming budget. That's an increase in the base funding from just under $9 million. And in the last budget, we had one time increase in funding of uh, $400,000. So in the previous budget, in the um, 1921 budget, we were at $9.4 million. The $400,000 increase was a one-time increase in funding. So we're now back at the base, which is just under $9 million. But the governor is proposing just over $3.7 million in terms of an annual increase in both years of the 21-23 budget. So we are happy about that. That's certainly what's in the ballpark of what we've been asking for. We asked for just about $13 million annually. So this is a positive development, something that we'll be pushing for very, very hard. We are working in partnership with the Wisconsin Land and Water Conservation Association um, and uh, working with their team. Um, we think we have a good chance to get something done here, whether it's at this amount or not, we'll see. But um, we'll be talking with members of joint finance to try to ensure that this is uh, um, affirmed by the legislature. POUTS funding, um, private on-site wastewater treatment systems. Um, and essentially there is a, a program known as the Wisconsin Fund that, that assists low-income homeowners with the repair and or the replacement of their POUTS, their, their septic tank essentially. Um, this program was set to sunset um, coming up in, in the end of June, essentially with the new fiscal year, July 1st, the program would sunset. Um, we had requested that uh, essentially the program remain in place. There's still an inventory of pouts that are being inspected by our county code administrators. We'd like to ensure that the uh, inventory is completed before the program sunsets, which we think would take at least another two years. And, and so um, we've asked that the sunset be lifted on the program. It is a benefit. There are certain, uh, um, uh, I'd say income requirements in terms to receive. Um, assistance in terms of repair or replacement of the pouts in someone's home. Um, also, any home that does get any assistance related to the program needed to be built back in 1978, July 1st, 1978 or before to essentially get a grant. And again, the program only uh, assists individuals with their, with their replacement of their pouts um, with up to about 40% of the cost. So there is still some, certainly some buy-in from the homeowner in terms of the repair and replacement, but it does help people on fixed incomes, low income, rural areas. And so something for that reason, we think we could have some buy-in from the, the uh, state legislature on. And so that's sort of a, a summary of some of the uh, key items within ag environment and land use. And so I think at this time, um, if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. I know we're taking questions now. We're not gonna wait to the end, but we're gonna go at the end of each issue area. And so happy to um, take any questions if anyone has them on environment land use at this time. And, you know, Kyle, I, I do see here in the chat, um, one of our um, individuals mentioned that the public hearings for the Joint Committee on Finance will be held um, in Menominee, not in Eau Claire. Um, and I think there's two others also, Kyle. I think one's in Whitewater and, right. and there's another one. Where else is that? Uh, Whitewater and Rhinelander. Rhinelander. Okay, yep. so Menominee, Whitewater, Rhinelander. 
Yeah, what we'll do is we will put um, in the um, chat box, we'll put a link to the uh, joint finance announcement. So everybody has um, the dates, um, the start time, the details for all those meetings in the event that they're interested in attending. Sure, okay. Other than that, Dan, I don't see... No questions? I don't think there are. Uh, one second here. I do think we have one from Jeff in Bayfield County. He says, um, on a lesser note, but very important to us in Bayfield County is a proposal in the governor's budget on land transfers sales to tribal governments. Um, <clears throat> Jeff is right. Uh, one of the things that, that we worked on with the governor's office in Bayfield County um, was essentially um, expediting or making it easier for counties to transfer um, lines within uh, transfer lands within a reservation um, back to the tribal entity. So that's something uh, we didn't highlight, Jeff, in, in the presentation today because it is relatively specific to, to one county, um, but it is part of our comprehensive uh, budget summary on our website. And that's something that, that I neglected to mention but should have is that a fully um, a full detailed comprehensive summary of the state budget is available on our website at wicounties.org. If you go to the legislative tab, you'll see a, a section for the state budget. Um, that is continually being updated as things change. Uh, we'll see a, a, a relatively sizable update when the Fiscal Bureau releases its memo. So please, um, you know, every week or every, every couple of days, take a look at that. And you can see in the top right corner of that document, um, it'll show when it's updated. And I see that Michelle did just uh, drop a link into that um, as well. So Jeff, that's mentioned in there. That's something we'll try to, to, to keep in the budget. Um, Dan, uh, one question here. Is there legislative support for the county conservation staffing increase? So um, in a, in a, to summarize the answer to that question, I would say yes. There, there, there's certainly a certain level of support. Um, you know, we're going to find out how much support there is for the governor's proposal. I think there's support for a certain amount of increase in funding, whether they're willing to go to $12.7 million, which the governor has proposed, is unclear. You know, and I'll be honest, I think one of our strategies, Kyle, um, on this issue really has been to uh, try to get the number as high as possible, because oftentimes what you see just in terms of a knee-jerk reaction politically, the governor will propose, and propose a number and the legislature will come back and say, well, that's a little high. Let's, let's bring that down. We're the responsible party fiscally. And so we wanted to try to get it as high as possible just uh, in the event that there is a knee-jerk political reaction um, and, and, and the numbers brought down. And so, you know, I think, I think that there is support. As a matter of fact, the assembly did pass um, an increase in county conservation staffing and cost sharing grants as standalone legislation from their clean water package. Um, they were, were at $12.4 million annually. The governor has proposed just under 12.7. Um, and so we're, I think we're in the ballpark, particularly with the assembly. Um, we'll have those conversations also with some of the senators on joint finance, but, but yes, I, I think that there is legitimate support from conservatives, from Republicans, from certainly from the, the governor's office um, and a lot of legislative Democrats as well. Any other questions uh, anyone has? Not that I see, Dan. Okay, then we can we can move on and we'll move on to transportation funding. And, and this is a major issue for our county. It's very important issues that we're taking up in terms of local transportation. And um, we do get uh, um, general transportation aids for the state for the maintenance of our county trunk highway system. Um, that money is flexible, can be used on transit systems as well um, in various counties. Um, there's a lot of flexibility in terms of how this money can be used. Um, and we've had some, um, I'd say, pretty good uh, years in the past few bienniums in terms of increases in GTA. Um, we're essentially right now, the base funding for the program on an annual basis is 122, just over $122 million statewide. And I would point out that GTA is allocated based on a six year rolling average of expenditures on county population and on county lane miles. Those are the three components related to GTA. And so if counties do invest their own levy into transportation, their share of their GTA payment will be larger. And if they do have a big project that's on the rolls on that six year rolling average, um, essentially the GTA payment that's gonna benefit the GTA payment. And once maybe there's a large public works facility that's being built, you know, once that goes off the six year average, well, then you're gonna get less of a GTA payment. So I guess my advice to counties that are out there is keep spending on transportation because it will help you in terms of the money you get back from the state. Um, and so, uh, you know, essentially um, the governor over the biennium offers up a, a 4% increase in GTA. It's not as large as we've gotten in, in some of the previous bienniums. In the 17, 19 biennium, we received over a 13% increase in GTA. In the last biennium, biennium in the 1921 biennium, we received a 10% increase in, in GTA over the biennium. Um, this is a 4% increase, 2% 2, 2 in each year of the biennium. 
And essentially by fiscal year 2022, we would be at just over $127 million in GTA payments. Now, when I started this position back in, in 2012, we were only at about $94 million uh, in GTA payments statewide. So a short nine years later, we're, we're I'm poised to be at almost 127. So that's pretty good. It's not terrible. It's almost one third of an increase or over one third of an increase in, in GTA payments to county. So we feel good about the progress we've made here in my time at WCA. Um, and we've certainly recovered from uh, years past when, when we've actually seen cuts in GTA. So this is a good situation that we're in. Um, we'd like to see the legislature maybe up that increase in, in GTA payments, but uh, essentially, um, We'll see where, what we can do. I know it's a very popular program for legislators in both parties, for our members, it's flexible spending. Um, and, and our goal, of course, is to get to 30% share of our cost in terms of maintenance on the county trunk highway system. Keep in mind that the money we receive from GTA is essentially our share of the gas tax and vehicle registration fees. And that's why we use the term share cost. And right now we're at essentially about 22% share of our cost for maintenance um, um, on the county trunk highway system. and so. I'm hoping to get back up to 30%. Um, it's not something that's gonna happen in one biennium. Governor Walker had actually proposed um, in his, uh, when he was running for reelection back in 2018, he proposed going to 30% share cost and I was contacted by his office and they said, well, Dan, how much would it cost on an annual basis um, to get back to 30% to share cost? We'd actually have to add about 50, roughly 54, $55 million to the 124 million dollars, or sorry, $122 million that is currently the base funding for the program. So it would be a big increase in terms of one biennium and we're only 20% of the program because the towns, they get about 40% of the GTA money and the municipalities, they get another 40%. We're at about 20%. The towns and the municipalities have larger systems in terms of their streets and the roads. Um, but essentially to go to 30% share of cost, if you did it for everyone who is a user of the program, you know, it would cost some serious money. And I don't think that's something we're gonna see in one biennium, but we'll keep trying to move the ball down the field in terms of trying to get to that 30% share of cost. But that's GTA, general transportation aids in a nutshell. Um, and then essentially routine maintenance agreement. This is dollars that counties receive uh, from the state in terms of the maintenance of the state trunk highway system and the interstate system. Um, essentially they, they are adding some uh, increases to the program to pay for road salt, 12, just over $12 million in fiscal year 22 and $13 million in fiscal year 23. Um, and again, we've had some rough winters and it's important to have uh, salt readily available to ensure that uh, people are driving safely when they're using the state trunk highway system and interstate systems. Uh, general transit aids, um, you know, we've worked hard to try to have increases in the program for transit. In the last budget, we had about a 4% increase in general transit aids, and we also had some increases in the previous biennium. Um, and so over the biennium in this proposal, we have about a 5%, we have a 5% increase in general transit aids, 2.5% in each year of the biennium. There are different tiers um, in terms of uh, funding transit, tier A, tier B, tier C, and tier D. Uh, tier A is uh, transit systems in Milwaukee County, tier B is Dane County, tier C is medium sized cities, uh, I'd say Eau Claire and Outagamie County, places like that. And tier D, D are your smaller rural, rural transit systems. And so they're, they're receiving, I'm not gonna go through all the numbers in each of those tiers, but there's some pretty healthy increases in general transit aids across the board and certainly something that we will work to affirm. And then uh, LRIP, the Local Road Improvement Program, essentially maintains current funding levels for the program. Um, you see the numbers there, but um, we did receive uh, uh, nominal increases in budgets passed. We did not have an increase in LRIP in the last budget, but we did have the, uh, the uh, supplemental uh, the supplemental program, the supplemental local road program for shovel ready projects. And so they took the money, the increases that we were initially gonna get in the governor's budget out of LRIP in the 1921 budget and um, included them um, in that program. And then prevailing wage requirements. This has been an issue I'd say that, um, you know, essentially prevailing wage has been a political football. Um, it's sort of a minimum uh, wage that you have to pay when, when you're working on public works projects. Um, governor Walker had, uh, um, eliminated the prevailing wage when state dollars are used. Anytime state dollars are used in the past, you have prevailing wage requirements. The governor's budget proposal proposes uh, bringing back prevailing wage. Um, I think this is something in terms of policy that is likely not gonna stay in the budget and you'll see the legislature remove this item, but it is something that the governor and the Democrats generally support. And then um, eminent domain for bicycle and pedestrian facilities. These are for uh, bike trails and, and pedestrian walkways, essentially, 
if a county or a village or municipality wishes to install a bike path, um, they're able to use eminent domain to, to get the property that they need. Um, there was a provision put in the budget a couple years ago um, to eliminate the ability of local government to do it for a bicycle or pedestrian walkway. Counties are still able to use eminent domain when they're trying to acquire right away for a road project. They're not able to do it for bike paths and pedestrian facilities, but the governor's budget would allow them to do so. And then the local multimodal transportation program. This is a supplemental program that was added in the 1921 budget. I just referenced it before in our discussion about LRIP. Um, essentially, uh, the previous budget, the 1921 budget, included $90 million for the program. There was um, just under $1.5 billion in requests. So it was uh, dollars that were highly sought after, a very popular program, um, shovel ready projects. And so the governor, in his proposal, affirms uh, $75 million for the program. This is money that will be um, used for those shovel ready projects. And essentially, this is paid for through the transportation fund, the previous biennium. They did a GPR, one time general purpose revenue transfer into the transportation fund to fund the program. But this time, um, we are getting one time transportation uh, dollars, segregated dollars, segregated transportation fund dollars into the program. So that's good. We're starting to establish the program permanently, which is our goal with this program. And um, these are shovel ready projects that legislators like. You can tangibly see the projects as they're completed, whether they be bridges, um, whether they be uh, adding a lane to a road and reworking a road, things like that. Um, so these are popular projects um, that legislators, I think, like. Both parties like the program. The governor obviously put $75 million into the program again for the second biennium in a row. Um, this was a program that was actually established by Senate Republicans. So I think it's an area of agreement between the legislature and the governor. And that's something that's uh, relatively unique in today's day and age. And so it's something that we look forward to working with the governor's office with Democrats and Republicans on in terms of sustaining. Dan, on that one, can you talk about how the, the projects were selected, that it was kind of a, a locally driven process? Yeah, we had a very locally driven process. And in terms of the, the county, um, we had three appointees, uh, county board members that were appointed by WCA. And then you had a series also of highway commissioners. I think we had nine highway commissioners for a total of 12 members um, on the committee in terms of just the county projects, the county projects. Um, and so they met up and they'd rank each project and then they'd go over their rankings and of course, they tried to distribute um, by district. There's seven districts within WCA and, and WCHA, the Wisconsin County Highway Association. And they tried to make sure each of the districts had an equitable number of projects. And so each project was a million dollars. Um, and and not, at projects, not all projects were funded fully, but certainly the million dollars per project assisted in terms of uh, ensuring that, that the project got done. And so I think that's a positive thing. Um, but it was something that was done locally by the highway commissioners and, and also by a couple of our county board members, and we really thought it was a fair and equitable, equitable way to, to distribute the money. Okay, we'll move on to the next slide, if we could. And I guess that concludes transportation. If there are any questions um, for transportation and public works, I think we'd be happy to take them right now. So Dan, I, I see we have a, a comment here and the comment is eminent domain change is not going to stay in the budget. I, I think that's a, a pretty safe assumption, right? Given that the, the folks that essentially preempted this are the same folks you know, still in the legislature. Th this is a policy item that we do expect to be removed from the budget. Is that right? That's correct, Kyle. Um, actually was uh, then representative, now state Senator Rob Stasholt, who was the impetus behind this change and I know that um, he likes the proposal that's, that's currently law. Um, he likes the current law. And so I, I don't think you're gonna see this stay in. And Speaker Boss has said that any item that looks like policy or smells like policy um, or is policy is gonna be taken out of the budget. So I think it's likely um, you're gonna see that um, be taken out. And so, uh, you know, it's it certainly we'd like, we, we'd, we'd like to have counties have as much flexibility and as much authority in terms of using this tool in the toolbox as possible, but I think it's unlikely we're gonna keep this one. Um, I thought there was one more question on transportation, but maybe. Um, I think it was just a request, Dan, to talk about the, the eminent domain. Okay, yep, I see that. And so we talked about eminent domain, so I think we're okay. And anybody else have questions? Otherwise we can move on. My colleague, Marcy, is, is all prepared to talk about county org and personnel. So I guess we're gonna turn it over. I don't see any questions, so we can just turn it over to Marcy and and um, it was a good discussion and I'll look forward to hearing from my colleagues on their various issue areas. Thanks, Dan. 
Um, so yeah, there's a lot to cover in this topic area. Um, first, we'll start with elections. So um, there were many different provisions in the governor's budget with regards to our state election. So I'm gonna go through that first. Um, um, the first change that the governor included in his budget was that the Wisconsin Elections Commission was directed to work with the Department of Transportation uh, to begin an automatic voter registration. Um, and so basically what would happen is that personal identifying information would be automatically transferred from the Department of Transportation to the Elections Commission. There would be an opportunity for people to opt out of this automatic transfer, but if you did not take advantage of that um, opt out, this information would automatically transfer from the department to um, the Elections Commission. Uh, the second provision included in the budget was one that we are um, supportive of. It would give um, municipal clerks the option to canvas absentee ballots the day prior to the election. Um, and it would also include several provisions that would um, make sure that the elections were still done in a safe and secure manner. This was a bill that we worked on last session. Uh, we refer to it as Monday legislation. It was Assembly Bill 636 and Senate Bill 574 last session. This has also been introduced um, or circulated, I should say. It has not yet received a bill number this session, but it has been circulated for co-sponsorship by, um, I'm sorry, Senator Staff Schultz. Um, it is LRB 2284 um, as separate legislation. But in the budget, um, it does again include provisions to have secure um, security for the ballots. It does have several public notice requirements. Um, but different from the bill last session, it does include that the budget can only, uh, in the budget, that um, you can only canvas ballots during specific time on the Monday prior from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, the third provision in the governor's budget related to elections is expanding um, the access um, for voters to eliminate restriction on how soon a person may complete an absentee ballot and provide that they must do so no later than 7 p.m. on the Friday preceding the election. Uh, number four is that uh, it modifies the schedule for special elections to ensure that they are scheduled in sufficient time to comply with federal requirements for sending ballots to military and overseas voters. Um, I've heard some positive um, remarks with regards to this provision. Uh, number five is something that we have supported in the past. And again, this has been introduced um, as separate legislation in this current uh, legislative session. Um, this is re uh, reimbursing counties and municipalities for certain costs that have been incurred during special primaries and special elections. Uh, this was introduced in the last session as Senate Bill 71 and has been again reintroduced in this current session as Senate Bill 21 and Assembly Bill 21. This did have a public hearing last week. Um, and it had overwhelming bipartisan support in the last legislative session. So we do support this both in the budget and as separate legislation. And number six, um, it modifies the Wisconsin Election Commission appropriation, recount appropriation to allow local units of government and petitioners to be reimbursed in a timely manner. Uh, the governor had um, declared that this was going to be the year of broadband and he held true to that promise by providing $200 million in his budget for the investment in broadband. And the main focus of this investment was to increase the funding for the broadband expansion grant program that's housed at the Public Service Commission. And in that program, he has provided $151.7 million in GPR over the biennium with $2 million annually from the state's universal service fund. And just for a way of background that the 2019-21 budget, there was an influx of $48 million for this broadband expansion grant program. So you can see that he provides a significant increase for this program during the, um, in this current budget. Um, in 2020, there was 143 applicants uh, requesting $50 million in grant funds. 72 grants were awarded. And since um, the inception of this grant program, there have been 210 grants awarded. 
Um, further for broadband, um, the governor's budget um, eliminates the restriction that certain municipalities defined as underserved or unserved would get direct investments in broadband infrastructure um, to provide services to their residents. Uh, these communities would then be able to apply directly for broadband grants from the PSC. And then finally, a new program would be established under the governor's budget um, called the Broadband Line Extension Grant Program and would be funded at 1.75 uh, million in the first year of the biennium and three and a half million in the second year. Um, and so for an example of this program, there's um, examples around the state where basically broadband infrastructure is within a mile of a residence, but because the service provider isn't obligated to, and it can be cost prohibited to run a line basically from that infrastructure to the house, uh, the residents isn't allowed to, or can't get the broadband. Um, so basically this program would um, provide grants up to $4,000 to basically run that line from the house uh, to the infrastructure that's just basically out of reach. So this would help those residents who can just, um, basically see broadband from their home and not be able to get it. So this would be a, a program for those who still need to get broadband but can't um, get it on their own. So Marcy, in, in divided government, it, it, it seems there's a lot, you know, the governor and the legislature do not agree on, but this seems to be one area where there, you know, there, there seems to be some commonality. Is that is that right? Yeah, and actually when we had our legislative roundtable at our exchange, um, this was the one thing that they all agreed that they could find commonality on. And so this was definitely one of those things that we were happy to hear about. And we know that during the pandemic, this was something that we heard over and over again from our membership that this is what we need to, to come um, and find uh, a solution on because everybody around the state, um, you know, needs to have safe and reliable, secure broadband so that they can continue to work from home, provide school from home, run their businesses, um, and keep uh, basically the economy turning with broadband. So yeah, definitely this is something that I think everyone on both sides of the aisle can come to an agreement on. Uh, UW Extension, the governor's budget includes $2 million in 15 county-based agricultural positions for UW Extension. Um, since 2014, Extension has seen a $5 million reduction in the loss of 30 county educators. So basically this will get us about halfway back to that loss since 2014. Um, our CVSOs, um, we're very supportive of our CVSOs and know that they have not seen an increase in their budget um, and their grant program um, for a significant amount of time. So uh, the governor's budget does include a 5% increase to their grants. The current allocation for a full-time CVSO with a population of 75,000 or more, would they currently get $13,000 from the state. Um, the next um, population from 45,000 up to that 75,000 um, gets 11,500. Um, a population from 20,000 to that 45,000 gets 10,000 and a population um, of less than 20,000 gets 8,500 and a part-time CVSO only gets $500 per year. So um, a 5% increase definitely would help. Um, and we know that the state grant um, is just a drop in a bucket of what a CVSO actually spends in their budget, but any monetary support that the state can provide definitely is an improvement of what they get now. Competitive bidding. Um, this is something the association has been working on since before my time here. Um, so our competitive bidding threshold in Wisconsin currently is at 25,000. And we have not seen a change in our threshold since the early 90s. Um, and this is basically for your small projects um, that are occurring in your local governments. Um, and we would like to see that increase. And the governor does include that increase from 25,000 to 50,000. Um, we have worked um, to try to get this increased over the last several sessions, both as separate legislation and in the budget. So we're encouraged to see this included in the budget now. And our hope is to keep this in the budget as the Joint Finance Committee works um, going forward. I know Dan touched on some of this in his presentation, but there are several um, changes um, regarding to labor 
in the governor's budget, basically repealing of um, provisions of Act 10 um, relating to being a part of a labor organization, paying dues to a labor organization, um, changes to um, prevailing wage. I can say with 100% certainty that these are non-starters for the Republican controlled legislature. These will be the one of the first things that are taken out of the budget um, and these um, changes will not be included in the budget going forward once the Joint Finance Committee takes hold and starts working on um, the governor's budget. And then there's um, a public records location fee that's included in the budget. Um, so current law is um, statute 19.35. Five, and this basically says that a local government has the authority to impose a fee upon the request for locating a record and that it cannot exceed the cost of $50. The governor's budget says that um, we can increase that to um, from $50 to $100. And so we're very supportive of this. Um, we think that um, you know having the increase to $100 to um, locate the public record is a reasonable increase and so we're hoping to also keep this um, in our in our budget going forward equity grants and i know that sarah is probably going to touch on this in more detail but the governor's budget does create um, three equity grant programs providing funding for public private and nonprofit entities to apply for these equity initiatives um, the department administration will be the um, keeper of the grant program and will um, uh, work with the Department of Children and Families and the Department of Health Services to administer the program. Um, and this grant program will be funded at $50 million in GPR. And that is it for the area of County Oregon personnel. And I don't know, Kyle, if you see any questions there for me, but I'm happy to take them at this time. Yeah, but we have a, a really great question, and, and that is with the, you know, the, the federal kind of stimulus bill um, providing funds that can be used on broadband, is the state going to take its GPR investment and essentially remove that and use the federal funding instead? And, and I think that's a question for um, a lot of items in the budget, right, is given that our understanding is the governor is going to have sole discretion over these funds, similar to what he had with the CARES Act, so you don't really have um, you know, legislative involvement, um, it's quite possible that um, the governor does direct some of these funds to broadband. If, if that happens, then potentially there's a pullback of the GPR. In addition to that, though, um, you know, we, we did see an announcement uh, about 10 days ago from Charter Communications that they're investing over $700 million um, in broadband as well. So in addition to just the, you know, in addition to about the 200 that the governor is proposing, you have the federal funds that can be spent on it, and then you have charter spending $700 million. So clearly broadband, is, as you said, Marcy, is, is going to be something that um, advances in this budget. Mm -hmm. But you know what that revenue source is ultimately and um, you know how much, I, th I think it's a big question still, right? Yeah, and I think the devil will be in the details too. Like, what will it actually go towards? Like I said, that you know they have that line extension grant. You know, will they focus on that? Because you know you still have residents that cannot get the service providers to take the you know infrastructure that's just outside their home and run a line into the residents. And so you know, there's still going to be people that can basically tell that there's broadband right outside their home, but they can't get the provider to connect them. You know, so will, you know, any of these funds be used to, you know, connect those individuals that, you know, cannot get a service provider, you know, we don't know. So it'll be interesting to see if, you know, those types of details are, you know, going to be included in funds from the federal government or, you know, the charters of the world that, you know, are, in, you know, investing their own money, or do we still need programs like that included in the budget? Right. And then a question here from Rebecca, how likely are equity grants to stay in the budget, Marcy? Um, you know, I, I think that they have a good chance, potentially, you know, we've seen that there's a, you know, the committee out there on diversity, 
um, and they're looking at this as an issue around the state. So I definitely think that it's a possibility that these grants could, you know, potentially stay um, in there. Will it be funded at $50 million? I don't know if that's a reasonable request as far as what the Republicans see, but I think that the issue of equity and diversity is definitely growing. And I think that everyone is seeing it as an issue across the state, not just Democrats, but I think Republicans as well. So I definitely think that's something that could be a possibility. Okay. I don't see anything else on county organ personnel, Mercy. Okay. Then moving into judicial and public safety. Um, so 911 and PSEP. So this is an issue that we've been working on for a long time as well. Um, you know, way back before I actually started here, um, back into the early 2000s and updating our 911 system. Um, and so the budget does include funds to support our PSEP, so our 911 call centers, and the need to upgrade our equipment at the local level. The state's been working on trying to upgrade our system um, from our analog system into a new digital system. But our PSAPs, our local 911 call centers, they also need the help and the support from the state to upgrade our equipment. Um, so the budget does include a seven and a half million dollar um, influx for a PSAP grant program starting in the second year of the biennium that PSAPs would be able to apply for so that they can purchase um, equipment and software as well as training costs for that equipment. Um, however, we have been pushing for $15 million for this grant program. So, you know, we're, we're glad to see that the governor included funds for this grant program, but we will continue to request that this grant program be funded at 15 million. Um, so we're, so we're halfway there. So, you know, it's been recognized as a need and we'll continue to work with the joint finance committee to try to increase this from the seven and a half million that's included in the budget, hopefully up to the $15 million. Um, also, uh, the budget does support the work that the Department of Military Affairs is currently working on um, to uh, change our network from the current analog system that our 911 call centers are working off of into this digital platform. Um, we need to get our 911 system onto a next generation 911 system. Um, and so, the governor's budget provides 1.7 million in the first year of the biennium and 9.8 million in the second year so that they can continue the work um, to transition to that next generation 911 system. The governor's budget also does provide $3 million in the second year of the biennium for a GIS data grant program. Um, WISCOM, so this is, um, a program, um, it's a radio system that basically we know is at sort of its end of life here in Wisconsin. Um, and the governor's budget includes six and a half million dollars in GPR for the design and impl implementation of a new statewide interoperable communication system. Um, and this is basically a shared land mobile radio system. Um, more details on this hopefully will be emerging because there really wasn't that many specific details in the governor's budget with regards to this. And I know some of our sheriffs and others, um, you know, emergency services personnel were concerned about this um, particular uh, item in the budget. So we're, we're definitely taking a closer look at this as more details emerge. Um, but Further details on this are kind of yet to be determined. Um, TAD, so treatment alternatives and diversion. We've been very supportive of TAD um, since its inception um, in 2005 when it was created under Act 25. Basically, this program is intended to provide grants to counties and tribes to establish and operate programs um, including suspended and deferred prosecution and programs based basically in um, providing alternatives to prosecution um, for those individuals who abuse alcohol or other drugs. So we've seen it that TAD has received more and more funding from the state since its inception um, in 2005. And again, the governor's budget includes an additional $15 million in GPR for the TAD program so that it may expand um, further into further counties. 
Um, ORS is opening avenues to reentry success. Um, I always like to include this one because it is currently operating in 51 counties. And this supports um, the prison uh, community um, and their transition of inmates living with a serious and persistent mental illness who are um, moving um, out of the prison system and back into the community. The governor's budget includes 2.2 million in GPR in the first year of the biennium, biennium and then 3 million in the second year for this program. And then the private bar attorney rate. So we talked about this um, extensively in the last budget. Um, and as you guys may know, Wisconsin did have um, the lowest private bar attorney rate in the nation at $40 per hour prior to January of 2020 when it was raised to $70 an hour. Um, and that was large in part to the fact that counties were going to be then at the same time required to pay $100 per hour um, because of a requirement by the Supreme Court. Um, now in the governor's budget, he includes the recommendation to index the private bar rate to the consumer price index beginning in the second year of the biennium. So basically this rate would adjust biennially and by a percentage equal to the average of the consumer price index over the 12 month period preceding. So this is very important because we're obviously a lot of times when um, a individual um, cannot find representation and the individual, the state cannot find representation for the person, many times the county then has to provide representation on the county's nickel. And if we're providing $100 and the state is only providing 70, I mean, obviously it's more expensive for the county to do so. Um, and if it is, um, if the private bar attorney rate is going to increase basically on um, the consumer price index, hopefully it'll become more competitive. So that'll be good, hopefully for the counties. And then last but not least, circuit courts. Um, in um, the last legislative session, there was a bill that passed um, that provided additional circuit court branches um, over the next several years. Um, there'll be four more um, this August and then four additional in August of 2022. Um, basically, the governor's budget includes the funding mechanism for those uh, positions um, that were included in Act 184. And Kyle, I believe that's it for judicial and public safety. And again, I'm happy to take any questions um, that the audience may have. Yeah, Marcy, we have one here from Fred. Um, does the governor's proposal increase the number of counties that ORS would operate in? Um, I don't believe that it necessarily increases the number specifically, but provides the funding for that to happen. Um, you know, if so, if the county selects to do so. So, I mean, it will, it will likely happen that that number will go up from 51, but I don't know that the budget itself selects that county. Okay, great. I don't see anything more at this time, Marcy. So I think we'll turn it over to, to Sarah to talk about health and human services. Thank you. Sarah, do we have you? All right, thank you. It wasn't, I wasn't getting my, I'm sharing, I'm the one sharing the screen and I kept moving my mouse and moving my mouse and it wasn't giving me uh, the, the toolbar to let me uh, share my, or uh, start my video or unmute. So thank you, Anne-Marie for catching that and uh, giving me access to do that. For some oh, reason, no. I had it up and then when you did the Q&A, it went away and it wasn't coming back for me. So I apologize for that bit of a delay here. Well, I would um, point out, Sarah, that Sarah's pulling double duty today. Not only is she presenting, but um, she's also running our, our presentation. So um, thank you for doing that, Sarah. Yeah, and I'm probably the least technical savvy of the whole government affairs staff. So maybe I shouldn't be the one doing this. Um, but there's, um, well, we'll talk about what's in the budget with regard to health and human services 
there are um, a, a number of, of recommendations as always in the budget related to the Department of Health Services, Department of Children and Families, as well as the Division of Juvenile Corrections within DOC. Um, there are two areas in particular where we see some rather large uh, systemic changes, and that's in the area of mental health as well as youth justice. So when I get to those two areas in the budget, we'll spend a bit more time uh, delving in to more of the specifics. Um, but before we get to those items, um, let's start with some of these smaller pieces that are included in the budget. All right, so the first issue I want to talk about is Medicaid expansion. And as we saw in the previous state budget, uh, the governor is once again recommending expansion of the state's Medicaid program as allowed under provisions of the Federal Affordable Care Act. Um, under the proposed expansion, individuals that have incomes up to 138% of the federal poverty level would qualify for coverage under the medical assistance program. In terms of bodies that would add to MA, it's estimated that almost 91,000 individuals would be added to the state's Medicaid roles as part of Medicaid expansion. Um, there is a significant impact with regard to Medicaid expansion on state finances. Uh, Medicaid expansion would draw down an additional $1.3 billion in funding from the federal government, as well as state, save the state approximately $634 million in GPR. So if this proposal does not move forward, we lose the federal funding, we lose the GPR savings, which means that there could be potentially a $2 billion budget gap that would need to be filled with revenue from other sources. I know that has left folks with a lot of questions with regard to the rest, the remaining portions of the DHS budget, because there are a number of increases and in provisions included in the DHS budget that are tied or funded with um, these, these dollars that come in from MA expansion. Um, what we do know and what we've heard thus far from the majority party is that they have thus far indicated that they are looking to pull uh, Medicaid expansion again from the budget, same as they did two years ago. Now, there is one additional twist to this as well as of last week. Under the Federal American Rescue Plan Act, the 12 states that have not yet adopted Medicaid expansion are eligible for a temporary five percentage point increase to the state's FMAP or the federal medical assistance percentage and that would be applicable for two years following implementation. So according to the Legislative Fiscal Bureau, Wisconsin could receive as part of that 5% increase in FMAP, $510 million in fiscal year 22, and an additional 515 million in fiscal year 23. Again, that, that those dollars would go away after two years, but again, um, that is something that I know a number of folks are hoping might incentivize the legislature to change its mind with regard to Medicaid expansion and, and hopefully um, move the expansion forward as part of this budget. So Sarah, a, qu a question here. Um, what's the reason or, or the rationale um, provided to, to not take the, the Medicaid dollars? So essentially, what, what are legislative Republicans saying as, as to you know why it doesn't make sense to expand Medicaid? From I, I think a lot of what they talked about early on was the fact that the they didn't believe that the federal government had the had the 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 funding available to carry through with its promises of maintaining um, you know in, increased funding for Medicaid moving forward. So I think there was a lot of concern that if the state added additional populations, the federal and then the federal government said, look, we can no longer sustain uh, this type of funding for the Medicaid program. It would leave the state in a really awkward position of having to remove people from Medicaid that were previously eligible for Medicaid or the state themselves would have to allocate additional funding to the Medicaid program, which then could put strain on the state budget. So that I think is the, the, the biggest primary reason that we hear as to why there is um, hesitation to move forward with MA expansion. And, and to this point though, Sarah, to clarify, um, the, the federal government has upheld, 
upheld its promises on this, correct? They haven't reduced their funding for the states that have, have taken Medicaid expansion, yeah. correct? That is, that is absolutely correct, Kyle. And again, um, you know, there's 38 states that have already accepted Medicaid expansion. So Wisconsin is very much in the minority with this. Um, I will say that when Medicaid expansion first was out there, we did make some changes to the state's Medicaid program to add um, additional eligibility for folks, especially for some folks that, that might be able-bodied adults without dependents, for example, um, your childless adults. So we did make some changes to make more folks eligible for MA in Wisconsin, but we didn't go so far as the full, full um, expansion as allowed under the Affordable Care Act. So well, Sarah, given, given that the, the American Rescue Plan further incentivizes you know, Medicaid expansion for those 12 states, do we think this changes the, the dynamic or is the legislature kind of you know, made their decision on this and the ship has sailed? I, I am not overly optimistic and Kyle, maybe you have a, a different take on this. I'm not overly optimistic that, that the additional revenue would be an incentive for, for the state of Wisconsin, simply because as you meant, as Kyle mentioned earlier, you know, one-time funding can be used for one-time purposes. So, you know, what we would really have to be careful about what we would do with the additional $500 million a year coming into the MA program, um, you know, I think we would hesitate to use it towards something long-term knowing that in two years, those dollars would be gone. So I, I think there, I think there would still be a lot of hesitation, just simply because that's not ongoing funding; it's one-time funding. Okay, no other questions then, Kyle. So we'll move on and talk about income maintenance. Um, the uh, this was really some welcome news that we saw in the governor's budget. Um, as many of you are aware. Our counties perform the eligibility determinations for programs such as food share and Medicaid through our 10 income maintenance consortia. And as we see in many program areas, I don't think it'd be any surprise to find out that the state funding that we receive to perform those eligibility functions does not uh, cover our cost associated um, with, with those functions uh, that we perform on behalf of the state. Um, over the last several years, we have been working with the Economic Support Policy Advisory Committee from WICSA or the Wisconsin County Human Service Association to really determine what it takes in order to operate um, the, the economic support programs on behalf of the state. And whenever there is a new, uh, a new requirement or new individuals are uh, receive eligibility for programs. We've been working really hard to try to quantify what that cost would be to the 10 IM consortia. And then we've been asking for that increase in funding. I would say the last few years, I think the, 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 the administration as well as the members of the finance committee have been really much more cognizant of the fact that when they make changes to eligibility or to program requirements in Medicaid or food share, that there is an impact on our IM consortia. And so they've been able to give us some additional funds to cover some of those costs. Um, in this budget, the governor does provide an increase in funding in the IMAA to reflect really an increase in the, um, based on caseload reestimates and updated program requirements of $3.6 million combined GPR fed in fiscal year 22 and almost $5.3 million GPR fed in fiscal year 23. Um, we've also been told by the Department of Health Services that there is funding included in the budget as well for, um, for Medicaid expansion in the event that that moves forward. Obviously, there would be some additional folks that we would have to um, you know, determine eligibility for, for the MA program. And so there's about $1.2 million in both fiscal year 22 and fiscal year 23 in the budget that we would receive if MA expansion does move forward. Um, there are also some program changes in the budget. Um, these repeal some of the changes that were adopted by the Republicans, I wanna say two budgets ago, with regard to such things as, um, requiring uh, folks in the Badger Care program to seek work, to make premium payments, to 
uh, to participate in health risk assessments and to um, pay some, make some co-pays for non-emergency use of the ER. Um, they, in order to maintain eligibility, uh, they had to participate in a number of, of these items, um, as well as under the food share program. There was a requirement put in a few budgets ago uh, that required drug screening, testing, and treatment for able-bodied adults without dependents participating in the food share employment and training program. Um, those things are being recommended by the governor uh, to be eliminated from the statute and eliminated as program requirements for Badger Care and FSET. Moving on to public health. Um, obviously with the current public health pandemic facing our state, I don't think it's any surprise that the governor has included an increased investment in communicable disease control efforts. Uh, the governor in his budget is recommending 28 new state positions, 23 of which would be assigned to DHS's or the Department of Health Services Bureau of Communicable Diseases. Um, three of these positions are allocated to the creation of a communicable disease harm reduction strike team. And two of these positions would be dedicated to data analytics and predictive modeling. The governor's budget also does um, provide some increased funding um, for local and tribal public health departments to support our, our disease control and prevention activities or our communicable disease activities that, that we undertake on a daily basis as local health departments. Um, the governor is funding those that, that program at $5 million annually. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm still waiting to hear a little more about what this means simply because it's listed as, as grant funding. So I don't know if counties will need to apply for this or how exactly this will work. Um, I think we were looking more so for a straight allocation uh, coming to public health departments for, um, for uh, you know, communicable disease control and prevention activities. And I certainly think we were looking for um, a funding amount higher than $5 million a year. Continuing on with public health, the governor's budget does also make changes to state statutes with regard to tobacco and vapor use. Um, as you may recall, a few years ago, there was a change to federal law that prohibited youth under the age of 21 from purchasing tobacco products. That caused a lot of confusion when that, um, when that federal law took effect because there was a lot of question about how that federal law interfaced with state laws. And Wisconsin state law prohibited the sale of tobacco products to, to individuals under the age of 18. So in his budget, the governor does increase the age to purchase cigarettes, tobacco products, nicotine products, and vapor products from the age of 18 to 21. That would make Wisconsin law consistent with a federal law that, that uh, took place, I want to say almost two years ago now. In addition to that, the governor's budget also makes additional changes with regard to um, recognizing the dangers that vapor products may have on youth um, by prohibiting the use of a vapor product on school grounds. It also prohibits the use of vapor products indoors. It requires a person who sells vapor products to obtain an annual cigarette and tobacco product retailer license from the city clerk or from the clerk of the city, town or village in which a retailer is located. It also allows retailers to place cigarettes, nicotine products, or tobacco products only in locations that are inaccessible to customers without the assistance of the retailer. And in addition, the budget provides for $2 million in fiscal year 22 to fund a public health campaign related to tobacco and vapor product use. Okay, moving off of uh, public health at this point, and moving on to um, some items in the budget related to caregiving, um, in particular, a number of the recommendations that we are about to talk about came out of the governor's task force on caregiving. Um, first, with regard to our aging and disability resource centers, the governor's fund, uh, budget does provide funding in both fiscal year 22 and fiscal year 23 
to expand services that are provided by our county aging and disability resource centers, as well as tribal ADRCs. Um, first thing that the governor's budget does is it expands caregiver support services to address the needs of caregivers of adults with disabilities that are aged 19 to 59. And it also requires ADRCs to designate a caregiver coordinator and to create a marketing plan. In addition, and this has been a request of ADRCs and others in the aging community for a number of budgets now, is the expansion of the dementia care specialist program to all of the ADRCs statewide. Now, the way this will work is that there will be, again, it's my understanding, one ADRC per county, meaning it is not population-based. Um, so while this is a, a, a welcome um, addition to the state budget, I don't think it necessarily means that we will be done asking for additional um, you know, positions in the future uh, for dementia care specialists. Um, once we get them in each and every ADRC, I think then the next step will be really to take a look at some of those higher population ADRCs and see whether or not additional dementia care specialist positions would be needed. What was not included in the budget, unfortunately, with regard to the ADRCs is the proposal that was worked on in, um, in, in cooperation with between DHS and our ADRCs and our aging communities was the um, proposal related to ADRC reinvestment. Um, that proposal would have I asked under that proposal, we were asking for $27.5 million each year of the budget um, to allow um, each ADRC to be appropriately funded for all of the services that ADRCs are required to provide as part of their contracts. Um, in addition to that, uh, there were a number of supplemental asks as well, totaling approximately $25 million. Some of those are included in the budget as part of this ADRC proposal, but many of them are not. Kyle, I see you've popped in. Does that mean there's a question? <coughs> there is, Sarah. Um, not necessarily on ADRCs, but um, the question from Robin. Homeless homelessness is becoming a bigger issue in our area. Is there anything in the DHS budget to assist local governments um, with helping and addressing the homelessness issue? Um, there... I, I have to say, I, I don't know for sure whether or not I have seen anything specific in the DHS budget related to homelessness. Um, I can certainly, Robin, go back and, and do some checking with regard to specific provisions in the budget related to homelessness. I do know that there is separate legislation that I read last week um, that I don't recall if it was introduced or, or just went around for co-sponsorship um, that does make an investment in, in serving um, individuals um, who, are, who, are, who are homeless. So I can go back and definitely do a, a double check with regard to um, budget provisions related to homelessness. Um, okay, the other thing I wanted to mention before I move on is um, there are other provisions included in the governor's budget uh, related to caregiving that I wanted to give just a quick mention to simply because they are included as part of WCA's uh, legislative agenda at the request of, of the aging community um, and, our, um, and our partners over at ADPA. So um, the budget does provide 40.4 million in fiscal year 22 and 37.4 million in fiscal year 23 to fund rate increases for personal care, direct care services, there's also included in the budget a non-refundable individual income tax caregiver credit for qualified expenses incurred by a family caregiver to assist a qualified family member. Uh, there is language in the budget that establishes mandatory initial training requirements for certain guardians. And there's also language included in the budget that requires hospitals to provide a patient or a patient's legal guardian with an opportunity to designate a caregiver who will receive before a patient is discharged from the hospital, instruction regarding assistance with the patient's care after discharge. All right, let's talk a little bit now about children's services and what is included in the budget for children with disabilities. Um, 
first the uh, Children's Long Term Support Waiver Program. Um, I'll probably refer to it here as the CLTS program. Uh, but this is a program that provides services to children with disabilities, much like the family care program uh, provides services to adults with disabilities. However, there is a distinct difference, um, namely under current law, adults are entitled to receive services under the family care program, while under the CLTS program, currently children are not. Um, the governor's budget ensures that every child in need of long-term um, supports receives the services they require by placing language in, in state statutes that says the department shall ensure that any child who is eligible and who applies for the disabled children's long-term support program that is operating under a waiver of federal law receives services under, under the disabled children's long-term support program that is operating under a waiver of federal law. Now, there is no additional funding in the budget for the CLTS program. However, there's, this is the first time where we actually have language placed in the budget um, indicating that children that need services will get services. Um, we have seen lots of language with re similar to this in the past couple of budgets. I want to say at least the past two or three budgets, there have been promises of of, um, provide, of you know, it basically eliminating the waiting list for the CLTS program, but entitlement language has not been included as part of the budget. Instead, um, they have just increased funding for the program. This um, really makes, you know, by putting the language in the statute, it certainly makes, it seems to make eligibility for the CLTS program now an entitlement program. Uh, again, similar to how family care is an entitlement program. Switching over to the birth to three program, uh, the governor's um, budget maintains increased funding that we received in a, on a one-time basis in the last budget of $1.125 million in each year. But then under the public health portion of the state budget, there is also additional funding included in the for the birth to three program to expand the program to additional children who are lead poisoned. And the budget provides $3.3 million in fiscal year 22 and $6.6 .6 million in fiscal year 23 uh, to expand services again to lead poisoned children. I know in talking to a number of our counties about this particular provision, I think there's some confusion as to why there is a focus on, on lead poisoned children. Um, a number of our counties have indicated they typically haven't seen lead poisoned children, uh, you know, appear um, or, you know, to, to the county or come to the count, you know, come to the attention of the county for services under the birth to three program. Um, and so I think what our counties may be asking us to do as part of this budget is instead maintain the funding for the birth to three program. I believe our request for funding in the birth to three program was a straight $4 million a year. And then, um, so I think we would just ask that maybe the legislature would keep these funds in the budget but take out the language that specifies that these funds can only be used for, for lead poisoned children. I think it would give us a little bit more flexibility with regard to the use of the funds, would allow us to um, you know, direct services in, in a better manner at the local level if we had additional funding for the program. I will say with regard to the Birth to Three program, the largest funder of the program, if you look across all of the funding sources for the program, is the county and county levy. All right, nursing homes. Um, I think it's no secret that our state's nursing homes have really been struggling to make ends meet, uh, given the low uh, reimbursement rates that are provided through the medical assistance program. Our county nursing homes, I think one could argue, um, are likely disproportionately impacted by the low rates, given the fact that many of our county nursing facilities um, serve individuals that have higher acuity levels. Typically, when you run numbers to determine 
you know, what the loss per day is on, on serving uh, residents in nursing facilities um, compared to our not-for-profit partners and for the for-profit homes, county average losses per day tend, tend, to, um, tend to be the, the highest of, of the three different types of, of homes. Um, the nursing home industry, I would say, has really done a wonderful job over the last several years in documenting, documenting the state's uh, caregiver crisis and the need for increased funding to support our direct care workforce. And so the governor's budget provides $78.3 million in fiscal year 22 and $163.7 million in fiscal year 23 in order to increase the rates paid to skilled nursing facilities throughout the state. That equates to an 11.5% increase in the first year of the budget, an 11.7% increase in the second year of the budget. Of the amounts that are allocated, $40.4 million in fiscal year 23 and $37.4 million in fiscal year 23 is targeted to the direct care workforce. All right. So Moving on, let's spend, we're going to spend a little bit of time now talking about some of the mental health um, changes that are included in the governor's budget. Um, I would say there's been a lot of um, talk with regard to um, mental health services the last few years, especially as it relates to the emergency detention system. During the last legislative session, we saw and heard from a number of legislators um, expressing interest in making changes to the emergency detention system of which counties are a pretty significant, if not the largest player in, in that system. Um, we know that law enforcement has been especially vocal over the last several years with regard to the emergency detention system, which caused a number of bills to be introduced last session uh, with regard to transportation associated with emergency detention, as well as the role of law enforcement in, in the emergency detention process as well. Um, in addition to that, we know that law enforcement has the ear of the attorney general um, and even dating back to Attorney General Schimmel, um, when we met with him and some other partners on the emergency detention system, he had indicated at the time that 71 of the 72 county sheriffs had indicated to him that emergency detention was a top priority uh, for them moving forward in the next legislative session. And, and they were specifically looking for some changes to try to provide some relief to the amount of time it takes uh, law enforcement to you know, initiate and effectuate and complete an emergency detention. So um, back in October of 2019, in fact, it was a very snowy Halloween of 2019 where Attorney General Call held an emergency detention summit. Um, that brought several hundred individuals from all across the state um, together uh, to discuss the various portions of the emergency detention system with the hopes of, um, of trying to make some recommendations that, that would improve the system, not only for law enforcement, but for counties, um, but more importantly, and probably most importantly, for the individuals that we serve who are in a mental health crisis. Um, the Prior to the budget being, um, being released, the Attorney General uh, released the recommendations or the results of that summit. I will say that the, the uh, Attorney General Call and his staff did a wonderful job of researching the emergency detention issue, really trying to understand it, trying to get a handle as to what best practices were happening in other states, what types of things could we emulate in the state of Wisconsin moving forward in order to improve the system. So for the last couple of years, there has been an awful lot of talk with regard to emergency detentions. So the governor in his budget did include a number of provisions um, to improve the emergency detention system in Wisconsin. Uh, this first slide 
talks about some of the um, recommendations made by the governor with regard to the lack of placement options that we see in the emergency detention system. I think right now, one of the biggest complaints is if somebody does need an emergency detention, the only place to go for, for many counties is Winnebago, um, which is not conveniently located to folks. We also hear that a lot of folks end up in Winnebago who maybe would not end up in Winnebago if we had some intermediate options available to folks who were in need of mental health crisis as well. So the governor and his budget attempts to address all of this by including $12.3 million uh, GPR in the second year of the budget to establish up to two regional crisis response centers. As part of the budget, the governor attempts to define a bit about what a regional crisis response center might look like. Uh, he talks about um, that a regional crisis response center would offer a crisis urgent care and observation center, a 15 bed crisis stabilization facility, and at least two inpatient psychiatric beds. The governor also offers that he believes that these centers would assume custody of emergency detention cases and conduct medical clearances. Um, though that particular provision, it appears would allow law enforcement to basically drop off the individual at this center and not have to stay with them through the medical clearance process and then uh, throughout a transport to Winnebago or another appropriate detention facility. Um, the governor in his budget also provides $5 million in the second year of the budget to establish five crisis stabilization facilities across the state for adults who are seeking voluntary crisis treatment. Um, each of these facilities would offer up to 16 crisis stabilization beds. Uh, the number of 16 is important because if you go beyond the 16 in terms of your facility size, it affects your ability to uh, collect MA funding uh, for services provided within the facility. Um, to, to be honest with you, while we support all of these provisions that are included in the budget, um, we are working with some of our coalition partners to determine what it is we would like to see included in the budget on, on these two particular provisions. The reason for that is there is still a lot of outstanding questions with regard to who would operate these facilities, how would they be funded. Um, you know, there's funding provided in the budget for the establishment of these facilities, but we don't know how the operations of these facilities would be funded. Um, we don't know where these facilities are going to be located. Um, you know, we also want to make sure that if we are going to make a significant state investment in facilities, that we are investing in the right types of beds. You know, for example, do we need more observation beds as opposed to, you know, peer respite beds, or what is it that we need across the state? So I think where we may be headed on this provision moving forward is to ask uh, for a study to be conducted in the first year of the budget that would allow us to um, make better decisions with regard to how um, these, these types of facilities would be implemented in the state of Wisconsin. In addition to that, there is other language included in the governor's budget too with regard to um, uh, tools that we think might might be helpful to folks and to counties and law enforcement when we are working with somebody in a mental health crisis. Um, one of the frustrations that has been expressed by, by counties and law enforcement agencies is the amount of time that it takes to locate an open uh, detention facility bed or an open receiving bed uh, for an individual in a mental health crisis. I think if you were to talk to any one of your county human services directors, they could probably tell you stories of the amount of time that is spent on the phone trying to locate an available bed, which can take hours and hours. And then once you find that bed, then there's all this back and forth with regard to whether or not the individual you want to place in that facility is a good fit for that facility, given its current mix of, of, of patients and uh, you know what types of medical testing might be needed on that individual uh, before the facility would be willing to accept that individual. So that takes hours and hours in which to accomplish. In the meantime, 
you know, law enforcement is sitting in the emergency department waiting to transport an individual in the mental health crisis to the appropriate receiving facility. Um, so while we know a bed tracking system does exist in the state of Wisconsin today, it's not up to date, um, meaning it's not, you know, live real time. It only tracks hospital beds and our counties don't have access to this, this bed tracker um, that, that is currently operated by the hospital association. So the governor in his budget allocates $100,000 in, in fiscal 22 and $50,000 in fiscal year 23 to create a bed tracker system that would not only track inpatient psychiatric beds, but it would also track um, such things as peer respite beds, crisis response beds as well. And this new tracker system would be made available to all entities involved in identifying placement options, including counties. The governor's budget also does boost uh, mental health crisis services by providing 1.2 million GPR in each year to support the staffing needs of county crisis programs, as well as peer run respite centers for their telephone services that provide aid to individuals in crisis in order to ac access this, this new um, offering by the state, a uh, 10% match would be required. The governor's budget also creates um, uh, and provides some additional funding for law enforcement. I think research has shown us over the years um, that there is, has been success in de-escalating mental health crisis situations if law enforcement officers are partnered up with mental health professionals. So as part of, at the request of law enforcement and supported by WCA um, as part of our emergency detention coalition that we belong to, uh, the governor's budget does create a $1.25 million GPR grant in each year um, that would be accessible to municipalities and counties to establish behavioral health and police collaboration programs to increase behavioral health professional involvement in emergency response situations in order to access the grant funding here a 25% match would be required. Um, we also know that training law enforcement officers on how to deescalate a mental health crisis situation, it's also a key component in determining whether an individual can safely remain in the community or is truly a candidate for emergency detention. And so the governor's budget provides $375,000 GPR in each year of the budget for additional crisis intervention trainings uh, for local law enforcement officials. And the budget also does as well provide $850,000 in GPR in each year to expand Milwaukee County's mobile crisis team. So a question came up during our legislative exchange presentation uh, with regard to uh, veterans mental health. So I just wanted to take a moment to address it here and talk about what is included in the governor's budget related to mental health services for veterans. Um, I'm a little less familiar with this provision simply because these are provisions that are included as part of the Department of Veterans Affairs budgets as opposed to part of the Department of Health Services budget. But the budget does expand the Veterans Outreach and Recovery Program by providing an additional seven GPR positions in um, throughout the budget. There is also the budget provides $100,000 annually to promote suicide prevention and awareness by providing outreach, mental health services, and support to individuals who are members of a traditionally underserved population, including minority groups and individuals who reside in rural areas of the state. It also is indicated that the department could enter into contracts in order to provide those services. A question was also raised during the legislative exchange presentation with regard to substance use funding in the budget. And there are a number of provisions that were included in the budget that deal with uh, substance use and um, access to substance use treatment. Uh, the first bullet point here on the slide is really, uh, this is just a, a huge, huge, um, a, a, a huge victory, um, I think, for, for counties and for folks that, that we serve 
as um, in, in our substance use programs. Um, if, if I, the way it works is if, if an individual wants to go into inpatient substance use treatment, uh, medical assistance will pay for the substance use treatment in the inpatient facility, but MA will not pay for the room and board charges. And so that really provided a huge incentive uh, for folks to enter into inpatient treatment uh, because either the county would have to pay for room and board or the individual on MA would have to pay for room and board. And clearly if you're on the medical assistance program, you don't have the funding available to pay for room and board at an inpatient treatment facility. Our counties, I would say, are were probably all over the board when it came to paying for room and board uh, um, expenses for folks on the MA program accessing inpatient treatment. Some counties would pay for this. Some counties would pay for it in limited circumstances. Other counties didn't have the funding and were unable to pay for these room and board um, costs at all. So I think uh, the, the governor's budget um, really takes care of this situation by uh, directing DHS to pay the allowable charges on behalf of MA recipients uh, for room and board who are in residential substance use disorder treatment programs. And there's just under $3.3 million in each year the budget set aside for this. In addition, there, is, there are a few other items in the governor's budget related to substance use treatment. The first um, directs DHS to award up to $500,000 in grants in fiscal year 22, and then up to $1 million annually thereafter to develop or support entities that offer medication assisted treatment. The focus of this particular grant program is on underserved or high need areas. The second uh, grant that is included in the budget is a substance use harm reduction grant. And the, under that provision, it would allow DHS to annually award up to $250,000 to organizations that operate substance use harm reduction initiatives as part of a comprehensive plan to address substance use disorder, particularly opioid addiction and its adverse effects. Then there's also funding included in the budget for uh, methamphetamine addiction treatment. More specifically, the governor's budget appropriates $150,000 in the first year of the budget and $300,000 in the second year of the budget to develop and conduct trainings for substance use disorder treatment providers on the matrix model, which they say is an evidence-based intensive outpatient treatment option that is effective in treating stimulant addiction. And then the final piece on this is the addiction treatment platform that provides 300,000 GPR in the second year of the budget to establish an online substance use disorder treatment program aggregator to locate, compare, and review available substance use disorder treatment programs in the state. So that is what I'm gonna talk about with regard to the Department of Health Services budget. Now I'm going to move on to items that are included in the Department of Children and Families budget. Uh, the first is children and family aids. Um, as many of you probably are aware, last budget, um, getting increases in the children and family aids allocation was our top budget priority. I would say due to the work of a lot of county folks on the ground, lots of conversations were had with legislators and we were very successful in getting the children and family aids allocation increase in the last budget by $25.5 million. That was about a 33% increase in the program. But I think as we all know, um, there is still a lot more work to be done with regard to funding and um, it, it, with regard to funding our, our child welfare programs. Um, you know, so we know that the need continues. In addition to all of this, by September 29th of this year, uh, the state of Wisconsin also needs to come into compliance with the Federal Family First Prevention Services Act. We'll talk about that a little bit more as well. Um, so, the governor in his budget um, did provide additional increases in the children and family aids allocation 
Beginning in calendar year 22, the allocation will increase by $10 million annually. Um, based on the start of that, there's $15 million um, allocated in total in the budget for the children and family aids allocation, but that will translate into a $10 million annual increase. Uh, the one thing I will note with regard to that, that, that funding is that funding is also going to be used to pay for increased foster care rates that are included in as part of the governor's budget. Our total funding amount in the children and family aids allocation will be 106.3 million in fiscal year 22 and 111.8 million in fiscal year 23. Now I didn't do the calendar year, um, you know, fiscal year conversion on this, but just to put this in perspective, prior to the last state budget, counties were receiving approximately $74 million annually in the children and family aids allocation, the bulk of which was federal funding. Um, if this remains in the budget, this additional $10 million in GPR funding, um, it really shows that the state is taking the concerns of, of county seriously with regard to our ability to serve children in need and will really show a pretty significant state GPR investment in uh, county child welfare services, which we are extremely appreciative of. Um, the, uh, let's talk now a little bit about some changes in the child welfare system that we are going to be seeing as a result of the Family First Prevention Services Act. Um, this was federal law that was passed back in 2018 um, that Wisconsin, along with a number of other states, asked for an extension with regard to implementation of the act. And so we have until September 29th again of this year to come into compliance with this federal legislation. Um, real briefly, um, the goal of this federal legislation is to keep kids with their families. And to achieve that goal, uh, the law shifts resources away from group care settings or congregate care settings for children that need to be removed from their home. And instead, they want to move toward in-home prevention services. Um, and when a child is unable to remain safely within their home, every effort is to be made to place a child with, with a relative or with a like kin caregiver. And when that is not possible, the next preference is to place children with foster families. Again, um, we want to try to the extent we can to provide in-home services first under this act to prevent a removal. When removal is necessary, we would like to put kids into family settings as opposed to congregate care settings. So this budget does make some significant investments in in-home prevention services that would again put us in compliance with federal law, including an investment of $3.8 million um, in state GPR funding and just over $2 million in federal funding in each year of the budget to create a full prevention service network of evidence-based service providers statewide. Uh, these dollars can be used for such things as provider training, travel costs, licensing and certification, and incentive supplements for rural areas. I think one of the things we always um, hear about is, you know, while a lot of these programs may be good and providing in-home prevention services is definitely um, the way we would like to go, oftentimes a significant barrier to that as a lack of, of service providers within the community, especially in rural areas. So I think the, the incentive supplement for rural areas will hopefully help build um, a prevention network in, in a number of parts of Wisconsin that tend to be more rural in nature. In addition to that, uh, the governor's budget includes an additional $4.6 million in state GPR and just over $1.5 million in federal money um, in each year of the budget for counties to use for direct family support services that are mostly and immediately needed to prevent children from being removed from those homes. These, uh, these dollars can be used to fund such services as um, support mentors, respite care, or rental assistance um, in order, again, to try to keep um, 
to prevent removal of, of children from their homes. There's also an additional $130,000 GPR and 70,000 Fed funding in each year of the budget as well to provide training and technical assistance to local child welfare agency staff uh, to shift our practices, which currently focus on child removal toward prevention. Um, the budget also contains language to ensure that if we do need to place a child in a congregate care setting, that that setting will qualify as a QRTP or a qualified residential treatment program. Um, if we need to place a child in a QRTP um, in order to receive federal funding uh, for that placement in the QRTP or qualified residential treatment program, there are a number of things that, that need to happen. And what this budget does is it includes um, language that puts all of those things in place that need to happen that would put it make again put us in compliance with federal law with the use of congregate care settings. Um, there's also separate legislation on QRTPs as well that we hope to have adopted prior to the budget being adopted um, so that we can begin planning uh, and implementation prior to that September 29th uh, date. Child support. So um, this is really a huge win for counties in this budget. Uh, very briefly, as you may recall, in the last state budget, the Joint Committee on Finance cut the governor's recommended funding amount uh, for our county child support agencies by two thirds. Since that time, and in fact, it was just days after the budget was signed into law, um, we found out about a new federal interpretation of, of federal regulations with regard to the birth cost recovery program, which um, resulted in the loss of some federal funding with regard to count our birth cost recovery program operated um, by our counties, uh, county child support agencies. And as all of this was going on, we were seeing lots of other states as well make an investment in their child support programs which then caused Wisconsin to fall in the rankings. When you fall in the rankings, it means that you typically lose uh, some federal child support funding. And it's my understanding that over the last year or two, we've lost in Wisconsin a couple of million dollars in federal funding due to our, our drop in rankings. Um, oftentimes you'll see um, a, a rank, rankings equate to the amount of financial effort staff that, 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 that local child support agencies or states can, can put into uh, their, their child welfare collection efforts. Um, so in this budget, the governor uh, provides $4 million GPR in each year, and that reflects the request of the Wisconsin Child Support Enforcement Association, which we at WCA supported as well. Uh, the nice thing about this $4 million is it draws down $7,764,700 in federal funding. So a $4 million investment by the state becomes an $11.7 million increase in funding to our county child support agencies. I think it is going to be very important for all of us as counties to have conversations with our legislators and members of the Joint Committee on Finance about this. Um, we really need to stress why these dollars are necessary, why they are important to make sure that, that a decrease in the governor's uh, recommended amounts does not occur two budgets in a row. Now let's spend some time talking about youth justice. Uh, this budget makes some pretty significant changes to the youth justice system. Um, the first change I'm going to talk about reverses the decision that was made by the legislature in the mid 1990s. In the mid 1990s, you may recall, uh, this was our get tough on crime era. At that time, we were, you know, it was three strikes and you're out, lock everybody up. Uh, we were planning in the state of Wisconsin, um, not only to maintain the two uh, juvenile correctional institutions that we had in the state, but we're also planning for the third JCI in the state. At that time, we had over a thousand kids that were placed in Lincoln Hills and Ethan Allen. And we knew that, um, that you know, if those trends continued and at that time they were projected to continue, we were going to need a third placement option for youth. 
I'd say I think a, a lot of what we thought was going to happen in the mid 90s did not happen. Um, and obviously, you know, we're down to, I believe, under 100 kids currently right now in Lincoln Hills and Southern Oaks. So that's really good. But I always like to mention that so we can talk about, you know, where we were and how far we have come in, in reducing the number of youth that we are placing in, in juvenile correctional institutions. But as part of that get tough on crime era in the mid 90s, the state created um, the Serious Juvenile Offender Program. And what the Serious Juvenile Offender Program does is it allows the state to hold youth up to the age of 23 or 25, depending upon the seriousness of the offense. If the youth met the statutory criteria for the Serious Juvenile offender program. The state became responsible for the cost of serving that youth in Lincoln Hills or Copper Lake, as opposed to the county. Um, according what DOC will tell us is that the, uh, the criteria that are used for the serious juvenile offender program don't necessarily make sense. The program in and of itself is not necessarily in line with uh, best or evidence-based practices. And so the governor does recommend the elimination of the serious juvenile offender program as part of his budget. But the governor does replace the serious juvenile offender program with what he's calling extended juvenile jurisdiction. Um, what the extended juvenile jurisdiction uh, program will do is it would allow the court to extend juvenile jurisdiction up until the age of 23, but it is not an absolute as it is under the serious juvenile offender program. Instead, what a judge would do is would give a youth in essence, what would be a juvenile sentence and then an adult sentence for lack of, of a better way to explain it. Um, once the youth reaches the age of, of 18, um, sometime between the age of 18 and 19, the youth would go back to court. The judge and the DA and everyone involved would make a determination as to whether or not the youth was making progress on their treatment plan and on their treatment model. And if the youth had made enough significant treatment, the court could say at that time that the adult or second phase of the youth's um, uh, confinement or placement would not be necessary. And then the youth would be released following uh, the completion of, of the youth sentence. So again, it, it, it really takes a look at a youth's progress to determine whether or not holding that youth um, up to the age of 23 is necessary or whether or not that youth again was actively participating in treatment and therefore, um, and therefore, no additional sentence beyond the age of 19 would be needed. Uh, the effective date of this provision in the budget is July 1 of 2021. Um, that is a bit concerning to our counties simply because it doesn't provide us with any sort of time to plan for these youth to come back under the county jurisdiction. It doesn't give us the ability between now and July 1 of this year to build community capacity to serve these youth. Um, obviously there's fiscal concerns as well with these youth coming back to the county. The governor in his budget does um, provide funding to counties. It's in, essence of, uh, uh, it's in essence a transfer of the dollars that the state utilized for the serious juvenile offender program coming down to the counties the amount of $5.3 million in the first year of the budget and $13.5 million in the second year of the budget. Again, not exactly certain what if whether or not these costs would fully be covered by the dollars that are that are coming back to counties as part of the youth aids appropriation. This budget also makes it um, make some changes that will make it more difficult for youth to be tried in adult or the criminal court system. The budget does um, eliminate automatic adult court jurisdiction for all youth that are under the age of 18. Under current law, there are certain, um, there are certain offenses that if a youth commits 
um, would automatically provide adult court jurisdiction over a juvenile. Uh, this budget eliminates that. And again, if a youth is going to be uh, um, tried in the criminal court or adult court system, they would have to go through the waiver process. Um, and the budget does make modifications as well to the conditions under which a youth under the age of 18 may be waived into adult court. Um, a waiver petition can be filed for a juvenile who's at least 16 years old and is alleged to have violated any state law that would be a felony if committed by an adult. Uh, there's also limited circumstances that would allow a 14 or a 15 year old to be waived into adult court as well. Moving on, in addition, the governor's budget does el um, eliminate state run type one facilities. And this is, this is important. Um, as you may recall, under current law by July 1 of 2021, the state is required uh, based off of legislation passed um, two sessions ago under Act 185, and then amended the following session as part of Act 8. Um, we have to close Lincoln Hills and Copper Lake, and the facilities are to be replaced with county operated SRCCCYs or secured residential care centers for children and youth, as well as state run type one facilities. Um, the the uh, state run type one facilities under Act 185 would be used to house serious juvenile offenders and youth with adult sentences. The SRCCCYs um, would be operated by counties. And again, we would, we, would, we would hold every other youth that would have gone to um, Lincoln Hills. But the governor and his budget eliminates the state run type one facilities and instead allows the Department of Corrections to operate secured residential care centers in the same manner that, that counties could. The budget also specifies that the July 1, 2021 closure date for Lincoln Hills would go away and that Lincoln Hills and Copper Lake would close as soon as all juveniles have been transferred to a suitable replacement facility. Um, the budget also allows the Department of Corrections to set its own daily rate until the facility is closed. Um, right now under current law, the, um, it is the, uh, the legislature that sets the daily rates for, um, the for Lincoln Hills and Copper Lake. I will tell you that the daily rate, especially given the decrease in population, doesn't cover the cost with operating the facility. The facility typically runs at a deficit. As we look to decrease the number of youth in, um, in Lincoln Hills in favor of more community-based treatment programming, I think what we will see this budget, if the legislature doesn't have control over these rates, is a pretty significant increase in JCI rates, uh, you know, starting July 1 of this year. Um, the one thing I want to mention too, with regard to state operated facilities is um, obviously as part of Act 185 that created the SRCCCYs, this, there was also supposed to be an expansion of the Mendota Juvenile Treatment Center to serve youth that have significant mental health needs, as well as um, funding set aside for the state to construct its own facility. Included in the capital budget is almost $46 million in general fund supported borrowing for the state to construct a new juvenile corrections facility in Milwaukee County that would serve up to 32 juveniles, depending upon what happens in this budget. Um, you know, whether it will be a type one facility, whether it will be an SRCCCY is yet to be seen. Um, in addition, there's almost $66 million in the capital budget as well to expand MJTC or the Mendota Juvenile Treatment Center. Um, that would serve an additional 30 males. And for the first time, MJTC would have the capacity to serve females when the 20 beds that they are anticipating building um, as part of the capital budget come online. Um, with regard to the detention facilities that are operated by counties, the governor's budget eliminates as an available disposition 
placement in a juvenile detention facility for more than 30 days. What that really means is the closure of our county run 365 180 programs. A lot of folks may ask, well, why, why is the state going to close our county operated 365 180 programs? I will tell you that DLC has never liked our 365 180 programs simply because they don't have the ability to regulate um, the programming and the facilities with regard to our 365 180 programs. They'll tell you that county secure detention facilities were never designed to hold youth long term and therefore they don't like the fact that counties can hold youth for up to one year. Um, so as part of the governor's budget, again, uh, our 365-180 programs would close. Um, the According to the budget, our 365-180 programs would have to close 12 months after the closure of, of Lincoln Hills. Um, now for us, that if you, if you think about it and we say, okay, um, so the state Lincoln Hills is closing, Copper Lake is closing, the state may or may not have a type one facility or its own SRCCCY available. We know there's only one county that is currently moving forward in developing an SRCCCY. So what are we gonna do to either increase the beds that are available for counties to make placements of youth that need placements, or what are we going to do to, um, you know, to divert kids from needing these placements? So, as part of all of this, uh, what the Department of Children and Families and DLC have been working on together is really a proposal that would focus on strengthening community-based treatment for youth that are in the uh, youth justice system. Um, you know, it, in, in order to accomplish that goal, there is funding in the budget, um, at, starting with a pilot program funded at $8.8 .8 million in the second year of the budget that would serve um, moderate to high risk youth. Under the program, counties are being asked to select an evidence-based treatment model to select a local community partner that has community community clinical service providers trained in the treatment model um, with the hopes of, of serving youth in the community as opposed to serving youth in an out of home placement. But I think no matter how robust of a community based treatment model we build, there are still going to be youth that will need to be placed in an out of home setting. So the budget um, does create a grant program for out of home care providers to provide intensive services for justice involved youth who require treatment services in an out of home care setting. The budget also includes funding for two types of residential service grants, as well as funding for a child placing agency to find treatment foster homes for delinquent youth who require out of home care placement, but are unsuited for congregate care. I'll tell you in talking to some of our counties, I think philosophically, I think we agree, the more we can serve youth in the community, the, the better. The concern I think that that gets raised most often is whether or not we have the ability to create the, the, the capacity or the infrastructure within the community to serve youth, especially youth that have you know, very significant treatment needs. Um, right now, for years, we've been talking about hard to place, hard to serve youth in the community. And I believe the state of Wisconsin right now has like 55 youth that are placed out of state because we don't have that, that capacity within the state right now. And the question is whether or not these programs included in this budget will be able to um, provide the capacity that we need to serve our youth moving, moving forward. 17-year-olds, uh, I do want to just mention that once again, 17-year-olds, uh, um, you know, there's a, a, a a proposal in the budget to bring 17 year olds back to the youth justice system. I think we've talked for years about why that is really in the best interest of these youth and why they're not best served in the criminal uh, justice system. The budget does create a some sufficient appropriation uh, to reimburse counties for their cost of serving 17 year olds and provides $10 million in GPR in each fiscal year. Um, to, to, again, to reimburse counties. Again, it's a sum sufficient appropriation. I will mention as well that this particular proposal is the same as what we saw in the last budget and it was removed. 
The final thing I'm going to talk about here is just one provision under the Department of Safety and Professional Services, because that's um, that's something that we're hearing more and more from our counties about. And you may think, why do County Human Services care about the budget of the Department of Safety and Professional Services? Well, what we've been, in order to serve as a social worker, you need to be licensed. A lot of folks that don't, don't go to school for a social work degree will go back, take classes to get their social work certification. Um, we also have, so we have a number of county folks that are, or county employees that are in that, working on that process at the same time that they're working for the counties. Um, a lot of counties will tell folks that they're hiring, you have six months or two years in which to complete this education and get the appropriate certification, um, or, you know, we're going to have to let you go at the county level. Well, what we're finding with DSPS is that we have a lot of social workers that are at risk of losing their jobs simply because DSPS is not timely processing the certification and licensing applications that are coming in. And so there is money included in the budget to increase funding and positions for DSPS with the hopes that we will be able to um, decrease the processing times that is needed for professional licensure. So with that, that is all I'm going to talk about today. I think we have six minutes, Kyle, if folks have questions about anything that anyone has talked about today. We do. Thank you, Sarah. Um, from Mark Harris, so what are the current uh, JCI rates and what do we expect it to rise to? I know there's a relatively kind of new way that they're, or new authority for them to set them in this budget, which is a little bit different than, than what we've typically seen. Yeah, boy, the current rate, I have to admit, I haven't looked at it in a while, but I think it's somewhere around um, $600 a day, I want to say, the current rate for juvenile correctional institutions. What that could go up to, I have absolutely no idea. What I can tell you is that I believe there's somewhere around, I think it's like $11 million that is set aside in the budget just to close the, the, the deficit associated with the operations of Lincoln Hills. So if you think about it over the years, they've always been accumulating deficit, adding surcharges to the daily rates to try to make up part of that deficit. I wouldn't be surprised. We could, you know, it all depends, I think, on, on how high DOC is willing to go. But I wouldn't be surprised as we see the numbers go down, rates hitting 800, 900, they could even be $1,000 a day you know, as, as the number of kids serving, we're serving in Lincoln Hills decreases. And then Sarah from Pamela Pipkin, um, they currently have 41 county resolutions. Can you ask anyone that has not passed one um, if they'd be willing to proceed? Yep, that's with Pam is the president of the Wisconsin Child Support Enforcement Association. Hi, Pam. Um, so yeah, so each county was asked to adopt a resolution supporting a $4 million GPR ask with regard um, to ch child support funding. So again, as Pam asks, if your county has adopted it and has not sent it in yet, please do so. If you haven't adopted it yet, we certainly hope that your county would consider adopting that resolution as well. All right, I don't see anything else in the chat or the Q&A. So I think we'll uh, wrap it up again, thank you. Um, everyone for, for joining us this morning. As always, if you have um, questions, comments, feedback for us, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to any member of the Government Affairs team, um, either through an, an email or, or a phone call. The Government Affairs team is all uh, back in the office, so um, we're, we're anxious to hear from you and we'll keep you updated um, as more develops on the state budget. Again, the next kind of big thing is that the Fiscal Bureau will, will release its comprehensive budget summary. We will then update our document on our website, um, and then we'll, we'll prepare for the Joint Committee on Finance and, and their actions on the state budget. So again, on behalf of the entire Counties Association, thank you for joining us. And I will note, um, for those of you that aren't Zoomed out yet, at 11 o'clock, we do have our county leadership meeting. Uh, that's the weekly call at 11 o'clock. So I'd encourage you to, to join that at 11, at 11 if your um, schedule allows that. So again, thank you. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you.